Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today for Can't Stop Sharing open source intelligence and social media vulnerability. My name is Lindsay. I'm the director of marketing here at Beyond 20, and I'm so happy to see so many smiling faces with us today. Uh, today we have your two panelists, David Worley and Mark Hilliard. So I'm going to really quickly tell you about Beyond 20 and then kick it over to them to get into this good, good OSINT business. So a little bit about us, Beyond 20. We are a transformation accelerator is what we call ourselves. What does that mean? So we work with people, process, and technology uh, to help accelerate your digital initiatives for the most part. So that looks like training to get your staff all speaking the same language. That looks like consulting engagements, like value stream mapping, uh, to make sure everything is aligned with your business objectives. And it looks like tool implementation. So as you can see on the right side here, we've got a handful of technology partners that we work with to automate, build workflows, get those um, value streams mapped, and then get them automated so you can get more work done more quickly. So that's all I have to say about us. I'm gonna hand it over to Mark to talk us through the agenda because I think he can probably speak to that better than I can. Take it away, Mark. Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, so yeah, we're going to just quickly give a brief introduction of ourselves, uh, myself and, and David, before uh, before we get into it. But once we get into it, we're going to talk a little bit about what OSINT is, open source intelligence, or sometimes people call it open source threat intelligence, uh, what it is, what it is not, uh, how it can be used. And then we're going to we have a little bit of story time. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some some of the historical places where OSINT has famously come in handy or caused some chaos uh, in uh, in world events. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how you can protect yourself as an individual uh, from exposing too much data uh, in, in your social media or really anywhere. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how our organizations can better protect themselves uh, in the in the grand scheme of things. Um, if your organization has a social media policy or social media uh, team or function, um, they are probably doing a whole lot to help protect you, but we'll talk about some of the some of the steps you can take. And then we'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end, let you guys uh, kind of pick our brains a little bit on OSINT or, you know, anything security related uh, that we're happy to we're happy to answer. Certainly if we can. Um, so just as a brief introduction, uh, my name is Mark Hilliard. I'm the one on the left part of the screen there. <laughs> Uh, I've been in IT for more years than I care to admit, but um, the security part of, of IT has been part of my life uh, probably for the last 20. Um, I worked in, uh, in cryptography and public key infrastructure um, with uh, GoDaddy.com for about a decade, uh, helped build their, uh, their commercial PKI systems, um, and uh, that's kind of where I really got my feet wet in, uh, in security was in crypto. Um, I have since obviously moved on. I work now with Beyond 20. Um, I do a lot of our internal uh, security work as well as uh, provide training uh, for CompTIA, ISACA, ISC Squared, um, sort of across the entire spectrum. Um, we also do uh, learning management system development um, and assessments. Um, I will pass it over to you, David, and let you introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll get into it. Thanks, Mark. So I am David Worley. I'm the ginger beard on the right next to Mark. And uh, I have been working in technology for about 10 years now. I have always been passionate about security. Uh, I got into it as a teenager when my parents decided they should install some parental controls on my computer. And it it's changed my life for the better. And uh, I have always appreciated the opportunity to tinker with technology and find ways to use it that weren't always intended. Um, my professional experience has largely been uh, IT infrastructure and uh, contracts with the federal government. I have pretty good depth of experience in uh, RMF risk management framework with uh, the Department of Defense. Also have some uh, malware incident response experience in my time with state government in Missouri. Um, 
and uh, I'm always, always looking for new stuff to learn about and always excited to talk about technology. All right, awesome. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just kind of give you guys a little bit of uh, what open source is and kind of what, uh, what it is not. Um, this is a very wonderful definition of open source, multi-factor methodology for collecting, analyzing, and making decisions about data accessible, publicly available sources, so on and so forth. What is OSINT? OSINT really is uh, intelligence that can be gathered both publicly and legally. Um, you know, we talk about data theft, data breaches, any things like that, that goes beyond the idea of what OSINT actually is. Um, open source means just that. It is publicly available. That means I can go and search on Google or DuckDuckGo or wherever, and I can find information out about anyone, myself. I can find information out about David. I can find information about anyone who's in this webinar. Um, if I want to, that is all considered to be OSINT, which means it is again, publicly available and it is legal for me to gather um, currently. Um, in the United States, we don't have a great number of laws <laughs> that are protecting people's privacy. Um, and that is why OSINT is such a huge business, uh, especially in the United States, but it's big worldwide. Um, last year, it's estimated that the industry supporting OSINT um, is probably somewhere in the $4 billion range. So it's not uh, it's not a small thing. It is a really, really big thing. Um, one of the important things that I always like to talk about uh, when I get into OSINT is that it is a value neutral data source, right? It is neither good nor bad. It is neither evil nor is it, you know, angelic in any way. It is just simply data that can be gathered publicly by anyone. So there are, what, what really comes down to is OSINT is how you use that data um, and whether you use it for what we would consider white hat activities or you know, for, the, for the betterment of society or IT or your organization uh, or for you know, so-called black hat uh, things where you are actually trying to damage or steal or expose things that you should not otherwise be able to get to. Um, what you do with the data counts, it matters. Uh, so OSINT itself is, it is a value neutral proposition, right? The data is out there, people can gather it, you can, you can see it, um, and that means that what you do with it becomes the important question. What you see here is, you know, some of the good things that get done with OSINT, finding missing people, solving crime, um, intervening in emergency situations. We'll have a, a couple of stories here on some of those. Um, some of the bad things that happen with, uh, with, with OSINT, um, spear phishing, targeted spear phishing is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, I recently wrote an article uh, on, you know, sort of how that might manifest itself with a, with a young tech just joining, just joining the firm and, and wanting to share their newfound success with their friends and their social media followers and how that can sort of snowball into uh, ways that bad actors could you know, potentially gain access to higher ups within the organization or data that they otherwise shouldn't have access to. Um, using social engineering, calling up someone's credit card company. Fact is, is that 90, probably 90% of the information that a credit card company requires you to provide them in order to open an account, close an account, increase your credit limits, change address, you can get all of that publicly. Uh, there isn't a lot of, there are only a couple of security measures with credit card companies, and a lot of that is stuff that we accidentally share because we're using things like pet names for passwords and so forth. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Stalking. Stalking is, you know, cyber stalking is, is, a, is a huge issue. Um, if you spend any time on social media, you see, uh, you can see the fallout and you can read stories, horror stories, um, about how people people's lives were ruined by stalkers online who used open source intelligence to find out where the person was, you know, information about their families, uh, all sorts of things that, you know, really were used to damage those individuals. So, so there is potential for good, there is potential for bad, as with all data, it's, it's just data. Um, but OSINT is one of those things that is, is freely available. It doesn't take a great deal of experience or skill to go searching for things. We do it all the time. I mean, Google exists primarily because of OSINT. Uh, we want, we want to find information out about things. So we use these search engines to, to track stuff down. Um, so <clears throat> what does that mean? It, it really means that we have to be very vigilant ourselves. 
as individuals, as organizations on what we share and what we allow our people to share uh, out there about us and about our organizations on the internet. Um, one of uh, one of our instructors who I adore, um, she's one of our one of our ISC instructors. We use her very frequently. Um, has no photographs of herself on the internet anywhere. Um, in fact, if someone takes a photograph and posts it on the internet, she has a very very polite but firm form letter that she sends to that person that says you need to take this down. This is private. This is not. I, I gave no consent to have my photo published in any capacity, and you need to take it down now. Um, and she's had to do this with friends and family. And <laughs> she is very, very protective of her image and uh, of her actual image, not like her reputation. She's protective of that as well, but her actual image. So, you know, what we share is important and we need to be uh, conscious of what we share out there uh, because it can be used for lots of different things. So um, a little story time. <laughs> uh, these are just a few, a few examples of where OSINT um, became uh, either was a big deal or was used in a way that was either good, bad, or, you know, maybe just, again, sort of value neutral. The first one is actually not a particularly famous story. This is just um, a, a colleague in information security who, um, who I've heard this story from because when they went to DEF CON in 2019, this is the whole story really is, um, and, and if you've ever been to DEF CON or you know folks who go to DEF CON, you know, the, the, the conference itself in Las Vegas is really, you know, you see people posting like checklists of things to do before you go, right? Turn off, turn off NFC on your phone. Don't, you know, don't connect to any Wi-Fi while you're there. Make sure Bluetooth is turned off. Don't share thing, you know, don't share any photos of anything that you do there because Everyone there is a hacker. Everyone there wants to take that information and do things with it, whether it's good or bad. It's just what happens. Well, this particular uh, this particular uh, professional was flying to DEF CON in 2019, and they decided that they wanted to take a photograph out of the plane because they were like, wow, it's really beautiful, um, and I want to take this photo. And they took the photo, and they posted it to Twitter. Um, this is literally on the flight to the conference in Las Vegas. When they landed in Las Vegas, they had over a dozen DMs in their Twitter account with people telling them the flight number that they were on based on the photo they had published on Twitter. That is crazy, to, to say the least, that people were able, you know, that, that that many people were able to find it. But it's also a reminder of, hey, we have to be aware of what we're putting out there. Uh, because people will figure things out about us if we're not very vigilant about what we do. Um, was it a good thing? Or was it a bad thing? Again, I don't. I, I think that was relatively neutral. You know, people were claiming that they did it as a, you know, as either a joke or a, you know, a send up or a DEF CON. But you know, that can be kind of terrifying how quickly someone can find out where you are, what's going on, just from a simple photo and no, with no context whatsoever. Um, so. Um, some slightly more popular, more famous stories around OSINT. Um, you know, just this year, uh, the the Capitol uh, the, the Capitol attack. Uh, people were posting photos of themselves inside the Capitol, standing at you know standing at the desk, holding Pelosi's gavel. Um, all these you know all these things that um, that the, these folks did, and they were they were documenting it, and they were putting it out on their own social media. Um, you know, arguably not a great idea. Um, you know, what, regardless of what we may think of the people who did this, the idea of sharing, you know, sharing basically trespassing on, on government property is, is never a particularly good plan, but it was done. And then, you know, the FBI and the, the, the DC Metro Police Department started using a lot of those photos to try to track these people down and try to find them um, because it was public knowledge. It was all very open and, and available. Um, so, you know, one of the things that kind of came out of that was misidentifying people. I've got a slightly more uh, harsher <laughs> story down around Charlottesville below, but um, but that that also happened, right? People were like, well, this person kind of looks like this guy who lives down the street from me, or or I know her, and, and you know, it was just a similar build and a grainy photo. Um, and so OSINT was used trying to help, trying to help identify these people who, in fact, you know, who had in fact stormed the Capitol. However, you know, we're not 
detectives necessarily. <laughs> we're not experts at this sort of thing. So there was a lot of misidentification and people were actually exposing names of people who they thought were actual um, were actual people at the at the rally. And those people, when they were misidentified, were getting death threats, were getting, um, you know, shamed, were getting their houses defaced, um, which, you know, that is that is dangerous, right? That that becomes very dangerous. But it also helped to identify a lot of the folks who were there, and it did actually help law enforcement. And law enforcement did uh, reach out to the public and say, hey, do you know this person? Here's a photo. Please, you know, if you have any information, please let us know. Um, so using that OSINT to try to try to narrow down, you know, people who were you know, ostensibly breaking the law is a good use of OSINT. Um, the third one there, Marcus Hutchins, if you don't know who Marcus Hutchins is um, in, um, you know, in, in uh, earlier in the in the 2010s, um, we had, you know, arguably the largest ransomware attack um, in, in history and probably still the largest ransomware attack in history with uh, with WannaCry. And Marcus Hutchins is actually, he's very young and at the time was very young, um, who actually discovered the solution to it, figured out how to reverse engineer the, the algorithm and save, you know, probably billions of dollars for organizations and governments across the world by essentially rendering WannaCry worthless. Um, interestingly, uh, turns out Marcus Hutchins, had that not happened, this may never have actually come out, but Marcus Hutchins had had a previous life as a teenager uh, writing malware. Uh, he wrote a lot of malware, and one of the pieces of malware that he admittedly uh, was a part of was used to steal money through banks, um, and that was the one that got him caught. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, again, because he gained a great deal of public notoriety through the WannaCry ransomware uh, story that open source intelligence actually narrowed down who he really was and what he had done sort of in a previous life, if you will. I mean, I don't know, he's only 25 now. I don't know how many lives you can have before you're 25. But uh, but a lot of that open source intelligence out there, a lot of it actually um, was was gathered by, uh, by an, on, uh, an online security um, analyst named uh, Brian Krebs. Um, he actually gathered a lot of this information and a lot of it was actually ultimately used um, to, you know, sort of track down and get Marcus Hutchins and have him arrested because he had done some illegal things earlier in life and that information was public because he had used, you know, an email address that was registered to him because he had domain names that were registered to him. Um, you know, those, that information, again, made public through their, you know, domain name registrar, through his ISP, those sorts of things were easy to track down so that it wasn't, it wasn't very hard to put the pieces together ultimately for law enforcement. Um, OSINT gone wrong, there, there's a lot of stories about this happening and even some, like I said, from the capital, uh, capital attack earlier in the year, this year, um, in Charlottesville, uh, in 2017, when there was a rally that, you know, actually did result in the death of, of one of the, uh, counter protesters who was there, was, who was hit by a vehicle. Um, there was a lot of, uh, misidentification being done during that rally. Uh, misidentification of, of the folks who were at the rally um, were being identified as white supremacists and, you know, actual individuals whose lives were, at least in the, in the near term, were ruined because they were misidentified as somebody who was there carrying a torch. Um, there was a, a gentleman in, um, in Chicago who was identified as having been there, and he wasn't. He was at a birthday party in Chicago. <laughs> Uh, during that particular during that particular rally, um, and it can be very harmful to those who are you know misidentified. Um, the 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 Boston Marathon bombers uh, in uh, 2013, um, there was a misidentification of a Brown University student that was somebody said this is one of the bombers I know it was one of the bombers it must be it must be it must be. And actually, it turns out that that particular individual had committed suicide a month before the bombings even happened. Um, so, you know, OSINT can be used for very, you know, mm. tricky things sometimes. Um, I'm going to let I'm going to let David go ahead and, uh, and and bring you the last one, because this one's, I think, kind of entertaining. And, and I, I know that I know David is a, is a big fan. So, uh, David, <laughs> you want to go ahead and talk about 4chan versus uh, versus the beef? 
Yeah, so if you're not familiar with it, back in, I think around the same time as the Charlottesville th uh, incident was going on, Shia LaBeouf had uh, started a basically an activist movement online. He was protesting whatever he was protesting, honestly. I don't remember. Uh, what I remember is he caught the attention of uh, the the deepest, darkest trolls on the internet, and uh, they decided to harass him incessantly to the point where the part part of his his protest included a live stream of I think birds or something. Uh, and uh, there was audio included in this live stream. The the trolls had decided to try to locate where this camera stream was occurring and using all of the tools and technology available at the time, they were able to identify like a specific piece of property that this camera was housed at and then furthermore they were able someone actually got in their car and drove around honking their horn while people online were watching this stream listening for the horn honk to <laughs> provide a positive identification and nothing to my memory illegal happened it was i mean harassment they were harassing Shia LaBeouf at, at worst, and I mean, he was kind of egging them on. Um, it was a little fun internet war between a celebrity and the the worst trolls from the internet. <laughs> and I mean, you probably don't want to uh, instigate with, with people who spend all of their free time doing nothing but making life challenging or upsetting to anybody but he did and they found him and they tormented him until eventually the the stream was brought down and i i think i think it's a really good example of something that was more or less harmless but it could have been a lot worse um you, you know, with, with OSINT, like Mark has said, it, it's value neutral. It really depends on what you are doing with it. Um, I have another example, personal personal example that I can share. Um, back, I did an internship with the Department of Energy. Um, I was uh, researching how to integrate a runtime system with a java back end while the runtime system was coded in c c plus plus and i let me preface i am not a coder at all that internship was way over my head but it was a great learning experience um but uh i was i was researching how to more or less make c plus plus play with java because they don't uh, and I had landed on a couple of different solutions in programming, and I wanted to test them out, but not being a coder, I kind of needed to have an example I could hack at to, to make my own code work. And uh, I was able to find an example on a archive of some Usenet forum from the late 90s that posted like a, a super simple example and I I used it and I was having trouble making it work for my code so I wanted to you know reach out to the the person who wrote this example on some old Usenet forum. Now this is in 2012, if that gives you any any hint of how old the post was that I was looking at. Um, I think Usenet stopped being popular 
by the late 90s, early 2000s, so I was at least a decade removed from when this post was made. Uh, all I had to go was the username that posted this uh, code sample, and I went to work on Google and started trying to track this individual down because obviously it was an archived forum. I couldn't just create an account and go post a question. I needed to be able to track down the person who wrote it, and I was pretty determined to do that. So with nothing but their username, I spent about four hours tracking down every instance of this person's web presence from the late 90s through to present time. And I had tracked them from that forum post to another forum post about six years later on a different platform, new username, but I had an email address to go off of now because that forum published their email next to their username. So with that, I was able to keep digging and eventually I tracked this person down, not just through their web presence, but basically tracked their employment history down before I even knew their name. Um, eventually I figured out they were the CEO and founder of a software company in Canada. I was able to uh, reach out to them. They actually didn't ever get back to me. I can't say I blame them, but uh, I like to use it as an example of just how forever the internet is. You might post something today that you'll forget about, but 20 years later, someone's still going to be able to find it. That is, a, that, that's an absolute truism. Um, you know, the, the, the running joke has always been, right, if once it's on the internet, it's there forever. And the, it, it's not, the, it's not really an exaggeration. <clears throat> information that we put out there, or information that is put out there about us, uh, will persist uh, as long as possible. It's one of the, it's an interesting side note uh, that I'll bring up here about um, about GDPR, right? The the EU's um, privacy law, privacy regulation um, is the you know is the right of every individual to be forgotten um, in the EU. It's an interesting clause and one that I you know I it, it's an interest it's interesting to me because. I don't know how feasible it really truly is at the end of the day. I mean, obviously, information we share can be can be cleansed, can be removed um, by by organizations that keep that information. Um, it, it comes down to how well they protect the information they gather, and and uh, really how much we protect ourselves. But you know, we don't have we don't have much of an equivalent to, to that in the United States, and and I think that's one of the Again, one of the one of the cornerstones of, of why OSINT is so uh, valuable in the U.S. is that you know it's it's all there and it never goes away. There's nothing that really requires that it does. No matter how much I want to cleanse my information off the internet, it's all there. It's all going to be there uh, for a really really long time. Uh, you know, unless the internet goes away, which I don't see happening anytime soon. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's stuff I'm sure that I posted 10, 15, 20 years ago that that you could probably track down if you looked if you looked hard enough. Um, I've been I've been in the internet I've been on the internet since it was the internet, and and that you know, that means that there's probably a lot of info out there about me. It brings a brings an interesting um, side note there. You mentioned you mentioned email, and we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, we talk about protection protecting ourselves is, you know. Um, understanding where my email address has been, right? I use my email address for my, my personal email address for everything, right? It's my login to 99% of the websites that I actually utilize. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, and it's fairly easy to find my email address. I don't think anyone would have to look very hard. Um, but keeping in mind that, you know, once that's out there, people can track me based on that. Um, you know, does that mean I should change my email address every once in a while? Maybe, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, at some point we also have to sort of talk about the, you know, the, the diminishing returns on that sort of thing. But, um, but that information is there and it will be there for as long as, you know, as long as anybody's tracking it. And, and if we've learned anything in the last 20 years of, of Google, um, almost 20 years now of Google, 
it's that you know information is very profitable. Uh, business is good at Google, uh, and they gather information for as a business model. So we know that that data on the internet is is of great value to many 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 organizations. So um, it's important to keep that in mind. All right. Um, I'm going to jump into a couple of uh, just a couple of thoughts on on what you know ways of protecting ourselves. You know, I, getting my information out there um, is you know I'm in a business where my presence on the internet is necessary for our business, right? For marketing purposes, I have to be I have to have a very public presence on the internet. A lot of my information is out there. A lot of my personal information is out there. Uh, and I know that, and I, I have been the victim of identity theft on more than one occasion. Um, and part of that is uh, I, I got, I got, I was super lucky. I got caught up in the uh, in the federal OPM, very public OPM office personnel management breach a few years ago. Uh, ironically, you know, <laughs> doing my uh, doing my clearance investigation <laughs> at the time, which was great. Um, well, maybe not so great, but I got caught up in that. I, you know, so my identity was exposed to the internet. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of info out there and what we choose to share, um, becomes a part of that, becomes a part of that overall ecosystem. Um, search yourself. I think that's one of the first, one of the first things and people will tell you this, I think, uh, across the board is, you know, do a search on yourself. Just go to Google and type in your own name and see what's out there about you. Um, I do this occasionally, sometimes just for grins, just for giggles, to see what uh, to see what information is actually out there and what possible misinformation is out there, but also to see what people, uh, you know, where my information is being used, where maybe I'm not so sure. Uh, there's a there's a really great website. Some people may be familiar with it. Um, some people may not, may not be familiar with it. Uh, have I been pwned dot com? Um, and just uh, just as a, I actually I'll I'll let. I'll let David tell this one because because he's the one that that thought to do it before we started this webinar. But um, go ahead, David. Tell him how what percentage of our of our attendance today, and you can include myself in that number, um, have been pwned. Yeah. So have I been pwned is a uh, website by uh, Troy Hunt, uh, which scrapes every password dump and every information dump that they can find for unique username passwords email addresses etc and they uh he's done a great job putting together this product you can search your email address and it'll tell you how many breaches you have been pwned in so i took the registration info that Lindsay shared with Mark and I yesterday, and I just dropped every email address into the search engine on Have I Been Pwned. 50% of the attendees registered for our webinar today have an email address that's in a public breach. If I were a malicious person, which I am not, I could probably pretty rapidly identify which breaches by doing a little bit of tinkering on uh, other OSINT platforms and jumping into the dark web to try and download some of those breaches raw data to, you know, compare. And I, I would say it would probably take less than two hours to, uh, identify old passwords of 50% of the people attending this webinar right now. Absolutely. Um, and, and I will, you know, full disclosure, I'm, I, I'm part of, I think listed on that site, three public breaches uh, for websites where I'm, my, my email address has been used and my credentials have been exposed. What does that mean? Well, that means that, you know what, I need to have lots of randomly generated and frequently rotated passwords. On the internet, and I do. I use a password manager. Um, we at Beyond Twenty have a corporate password manager that we utilize. Um, not sponsoring us in any way, and I don't need to. I'm not going to mention which one it is, but uh, there are plenty of them out there. Uh, then most of them are pretty good uh, at encrypting passwords and generating passwords for you. Um, I learned long ago when I was first started working in, in PKI and in cryptography. 
uh, one of my one of my engineering colleagues uh, said, you know, if you held a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you any one of my own passwords. I don't know any of them. I and I, and it's, I don't either. I couldn't tell you. I, I there's one password that I have to know, and I muscle memory that password. Like I couldn't tell you what it is if you ask me. Um, I can type it out because I I have to, but <laughs> but I don't know the actual I don't know the actual password. I couldn't tell you any of my passwords. They're all completely random. I, I don't have any idea what they are, and I rotate them. I rotate them as often as I can. Password rotation. There's certainly a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of discussion around whether or not password rotation is a, is a necessarily good uh, practice, or if it's you know if it's kind of a waste. Um, I, I like to rotate my passwords occasionally. I don't know that it's that it's abs I don't know that the value is really really high in doing that since all of them are random. I don't really care. Um, David, tell, tell folks what you do. Actually, I love this one. I, I hadn't really thought about doing this, but what do you do for your internet passwords? <laughs> so I am of just, just a touch paranoid about password managers, and I've never jumped on the bandwagon for my personal uh, accounts. I just use recovery mechanisms anytime I have to reauthenticate. I will create a new password. I will log in and do what I'm going to do in whatever service I'm logging into. And then when I get off of my computer, I forget the password. I do not remember it like 99% of the time. Uh, and so I just click recover my password to log in because it's faster to uh, answer a couple of security questions or enter a code that gets texted to me or emailed to me than it is to try and remember which of the thousands of passwords I've generated I used on that website. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting, it's it's a fun sort of, um, speaking of tinkering and hacking, right, that is not, I mean, it's not the way that that particular mechanism was designed to be used, right, it was for when you actually forgot your password through whatever whatever reason, but you're actually using it as a way to secure your password and that you have no idea what your password is. And the only way you can log in is by recovering a new, is by resetting your password, which I think is, uh, it's it's a fascinating way of, of securing your personal data. Um, I, and like I said, it actually hadn't occurred to me to do that. I mean, I've certainly done it plenty of times because I don't know my passwords, but, uh, but recognizing that yeah, it is a security mechanism, you can simply say, hey, look, I don't know what my password is. I'm just gonna have you guys help me reset it. And that's how I log into every website. Um, I think that's I think that's a really interesting uh, a really interesting twist on on protecting yourself and and protecting your passwords quite honestly. Um, but you mentioned security questions and that is actually one of the bullets here on protecting yourself. Uh, I learned this from a social engineer. Um, she's a relatively well known social engineer. She actually works on uh, IBM's red team, and uh, her thing is don't answer security questions honestly. They want to know what city you were born in. Lie. Use a different city. Don't use your your own birth city. It's not hard for me to figure out where you were born. It's not hard for me to figure out who your best friend as a child was. It's not hard for me to figure out your mother's maiden name, right? The actual answers to those questions, most of the time are public or public adjacent. I can generally find them through fairly, fairly rudimentary means. Um, so, so her suggestion, and I think it's a great one, is why? I, you don't. I don't have to tell the website that I was born in X city, right? I can tell I was born in LA, or I was born in Seattle, or I was born in Vancouver. I wasn't born in any of those cities, right? Use use incorrect information, or use information that isn't even related to the question, right? What city were you born in? Purple, right? <laughs> whatever. It doesn't matter. The answer to the question is just something you need to know. It doesn't have to be the truth. Um, and I think that's actually kind of a cool, uh, a cool suggestion on using those those security questions because, like I said, most of those questions are questions that are fairly easy for me to go and find and and get the answers to. And all of a sudden now I can reset your password on any site if I know if I if I simply have your 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 username. And so often our usernames are our email, which again our email addresses are generally pretty public and easy to find. Um, finally, I'm monitoring what data is collected by websites. Pretty much every every website now, mostly because of GDPR now, California has a pretty extensive privacy law as well, uh, requ is required to talk about cookies. And frankly, cookies are going away um, since Google has now stated that they are going to stop supporting cookies. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, read the cookie 
disclaimers on websites. Um, I'm, I'm pretty vigilant about this. I didn't used to be, uh, but I am now, and I usually turn off everything that isn't absolutely necessary for the website to run. Um, I don't like the, and I don't really particularly like websites that tell me that, you know, I'm just, by being there, I'm accepting their cookie policy. Um, do I still use those websites? Yes, I can't say that I just simply go, well, I'm not gonna use this website because it doesn't have a good cookie policy. Uh, but I do try to stay vigilant about what information is being gathered about me and what what you know what cookies are being stored on my computer. I also delete all cookies immediately upon exiting my browser, and I exit my browser every single day. So <laughs> um, I don't remember really any websites, um, and you know I, I have to go back and, and relog in. None of the remember me checkboxes ever get checked, and even if they do, they're they're gone the next time I log in. So. Um, you know, be more vigilant about what, you know, what sorts of, what sorts of information you are allowing websites to gather about you. I'm, I'm pretty, um, personally very frustrated by the fact that, you know, uh, when a website decides it wants to know your location, um, the default is that you allow it, by the way, in most browser, most browser platforms is that it's a lot, you're there, that every website is allowed to know your location, your geographic location. Um, I turned that off immediately in my settings. Uh, similarly, uh, sending notifications. Oh, a website sending me notifications on my desktop? I, no, I don't want that. Um, I, it's, it's, it's frustrating to me that I have to answer no to that. I mean, it should be something that I have to opt into uh, and have to, you know, seek out to opt into. I find those things to be uh, very frustrating. But a lot of the time, and a lot of people just click right through. Yeah, whatever, no big deal. Fine, let's do it. Um, you know, and that information becomes very easily accessible and probably sold, quite honestly. You know, um, our data is being sold left and right. And like I said, it's a very, very lucrative industry to be in uh, business-wise. And we just have to maintain a, a great deal of vigilance around uh, what data we're sharing and what data we're allowing to be collected about ourselves. Hey, Mark. Uh, David, I'm gonna, yeah. I want to interrupt you guys really quickly um, with a likely uh, amateur comment but considering I'm coming from marketing and don't know anything about this, uh, you mentioned social engineering earlier on the slide, and that reminded me of those quizzes on Twitter and Facebook. I won't repeat any of them because I forget exactly how they go, but it's your X name is the street you grew up on plus your mother's middle name, twice removed cousins, shoe size, whatever. Uh, don't do those. Definitely don't do those. <laughs> Definitely don't do those. What, yeah, what, what, what wizarding house are you a part of? Um, oh, I'm Gryffindor. Yeah. Well, they ask a bunch of questions. Yeah, they ask a lot of, of data collection questions to, to get you there. And I, you know, the algorithm I'm sure is, is fairly rudimentary, but yeah, they're gathering data. You're absolutely right. 100%. Those sorts of things are, are a surefire way to get your data shared with, you know, likely, I mean, mostly they're profiteers. These aren't people who are really looking to do damage or be, you know, truly malicious in any way, but they are gathering data about you for marketing reasons. They're, you know, to, to sell that data to other organizations um, in order to, to, in order to make money. Absolutely. Um, but that information then becomes, you know, something that anyone can buy. If I'm a bad actor, I can, if I have the, the financial means, I can go out and buy that kind of data. I can't tell you how many emails I get on a daily basis um, you know, asking me if I would like a list of a list of licensees for software from vendors that we as beyond at beyond 20 partner with. I get probably a dozen a day. Hey, how many, you know, would you like, would you like to buy a list of ServiceNow users? Would you like to buy a list of Sherwell every day? I get a dozen of them every single day. Um, because people are gathering that information out on the internet. Absolutely, 100%. So yeah, be very careful when you go and do those really cool. Used to be on Facebook, now they're on Twitter, everywhere else. You know, I don't, I don't know if they're on TikTok because I'm not on TikTok, but I'm sure they're everywhere. Uh, you know, every website you go to um, has something on there about, hey, what, you know, what, what sort of person are you? Answer these 42 easy questions, um, and yeah, they're asking you very, very personal data questions. Um, and none of them are probably feeding into an algorithm that actually gives you back a good answer. So <laughs> yeah. very, very good point. So I wanna usher us along here a little bit cause we've got some questions rolling in and I wanna make sure we've got plenty of time to pack as many of those in as possible. 
Um, I know we want to tackle protection a little bit more before we get to Q&A. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. So um, a couple of other things here. Uh, this is another one from the from the same social engineer that that I uh, that, that that I quote actually in my blog. But um, understanding what is in the background. Uh, if I post a picture to social media, this goes in you know the picture out of the plane. But um, you know, pretty famously and very recently, a, a, a member of Congress posted a photo. Um, it was a it was a very emotionally charged post, but that's kind of beside the point. Um, what he actually posted on Twitter was a picture of his computer monitor. And at the bottom of his computer monitor was a post-it note that had his Gmail account name and his Gmail password printed on it. And very, very clearly, you could easily read it with a, just a slight zoom on the photo. It's important context matters. <laughs> if you're going to post something to social media, if you're going to post information about yourself, a photo of anything, recognize that there may be things in that photograph that identify your location, that identify who you are, that may identify things about you that you do not want known. And if you post those things publicly, they become part of the OSINT ecosystem and they can be gathered and they can be used against you um, in, in many, many, many ways. So uh, be very aware of what's in the photograph, uh, what's in the background of the photograph. Um, I had a coworker recently post a photo of their own garage Right. It, and it was a local. It was it was only within our, our collaborative tool um, at, at work. But but he wanted to post a cool picture of of his of his garage. And in the background, there was some identifying information um, about something that, you know, it was about it was it was personal for him. Right. It wasn't something that was part of his professional persona. It wasn't something that really had anything to do with work. Um, the picture itself didn't really. But what he was trying to share was not was also not related to that thing in the background. And I asked him about it. I said, hey, what's that thing in the background? And he explained it to me. And, and it was, you know, it, it was relatively harmless. But if I, if he posted that photo to Twitter and I was looking to, I was looking to socially engineer him, I could have used that object in the background, which was obscure and not something he's ever talked about, not something, you know, not something that was specific to his to his personality or his, you know, his hobbies or anything, but I could have used that information to gain access probably to his family if I had wanted to, right? I could say, oh, I know now that this is an interest in his life that he doesn't share with other people, right? Unless, unless he's asked, and again, because he's a coworker and, and we're relatively friendly, it was, you know, it was a friendly conversation, but had he shared that publicly and somebody who wanted to get access and, you know, leverage, you know, call up, you know, get information about a family member, call that family member, and then use that bit of information as a way of showing familiarity. And that's a real common thing that fishers will do, that, that folks that are coming in and trying to socially engineer will say, oh, you know, I was, you know, I was with your cousin doing this thing that I know that you're into because you posted something about it, but most people wouldn't know that, right? That's the kind of OSINT that can start getting used that way. So be very careful about context and what you're putting out there. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about organizational level as well, because these are, because those of us who, who do have to help protect our organization from these kinds of breaches, protect our data, protect our, uh, you know, protect our bottom line, quite honestly. Um, Data governance is probably the biggest way, you know, classifying our data, using role-based access controls, um, and strong administrative policies, especially around, especially around things like social media, right? You don't want to, you want to make sure that people are separating professional and personal, because once you kind of cross that line and, and personal becomes part of your professional persona, it makes it much, much easier for you to be compromised. Uh, because people, once people know things personally about you, they can use those things to gain access to professional information that you might not otherwise want to divulge or shouldn't divulge, um, you know, based on your company's policies. So um, you want to create a, a social media policy for your employees, not something that's so restrictive. I mean, we don't want to we don't want to be the, the the draconian, you know, beat you down kind of people. But our policies do need to say, look, you if you're going to post personal information or you're going to make personal posts on your social media, do it in a separate account. Don't connect it to your main, you know, be sure that your personal and your professional are separated. If, you know, if you want to, you know, if, if you're afraid of breach happening as a result. So keep that in mind. Um, 
<laughs> I'll link this last one, benchmarking to gauge how strong security posture is relative to your competitors. Again, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun the people who are beside me. Um, absolutely uh, keep in mind that, you know, you are in a space where you have competitors and competitive advantage is a thing. Um, and being able to leverage OSINT in order to gain competitive advantage uh, can, be, can be pretty powerful. Um, so just keep that in mind. Most of this around OSINT is administrative. There aren't a lot of technical controls that can keep, you know, keep our publicly available information private. Um, so, you know, it does come down to people. This is a very people-oriented part of information security in that you do have to make sure that the controls in place are more, more policy and administrative based um, and that they're strong and well understood, um, you know, and make sure you're make sure you're talking to your people. Make sure you're saying, hey, you know, what do you think about doing something like this? Do you think this is uh, this is good policy? Um, you know, or, you know, bring up, hey, look, I noticed you posted something on social media this week. It was, you know, might not have been might not have been as professionally related as it should be. Um, you know, people put put some personal stuff out there. So so keep that in mind as well. Um, David, I'll let you I'll let you finish anything else. You, you, any other uh, possible uh, tips you may have for protecting, uh, you know, protecting information and, and keeping OSINT to a minimum? Yeah, so so I just really want to add that uh, I think on the last slide of the docs yourself part, Google is only the first step. There are a hundred other search engines that have been developed specific for OSINT operations. Um, there's actually a website out there called OSINT Framework that links to a ton of different OSINT-focused tools, platforms, utilities. Some of them are GitHub uh, repos that you can uh, clone and use yourself. Some of them are freely available without any download required, without any login required. Um, and also, there are a number of tools out there that you can pay for. When we talk about open source, everybody always assumes free software. But with open source inf uh, intelligence, we're not necessarily talking about free as in we're not paying for it. The information about you exists regardless. Hundreds of organizations have recognized that and aggregated it to be able to sell it. A um, couple of uh, notable ones are like Spokio and Been Verified. Both of those are pretty reasonably priced products that can get you a whole lot of dirt on yourself or on someone you might be investigating. Um, if you're an investigator, that is one of the first websites you're going to land on, or those are one of the first websites you're going to land on. Um, if you are a human resources person vetting a potential employee, those are possibly going to be some of your first checks before moving forward with a candidate. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is from a personal protection standpoint and also from an organizational standpoint, know what you have, know what's out there, dox yourself, dox your employees. Um, you know, I, I think there is uh, a real value to, you know, security personnel in an organization researching the employees of that organization. You can identify other threats by doing this as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I know we, I wanted to get, I, Lindsay, you said there were a couple of questions, so I do want to get to those. But yeah, there, there's a lot of, re, there are a lot of resources out there, both paid and free for, for, for gathering OSINT. And, and yeah, I'd say, again, on a, you're right, on a personal level, know what information about you is out there. It's probably the, the, your biggest defense, right? Knowing that that information is available, okay, then somebody might try to use that against me, right? And that's, um, I think of it as it's like a clearance investigation on yourself. Uh, <laughs> what could possibly be leveraged to get at me um, or get around me? Uh, Lindsay, you want to you throw a couple of questions at us? I would love nothing more. Thank you. 
let's see how many we can get through in these last four minutes here. So the first question is around using OSINT, how to use OSINT uh, to protect senior level folks within your organization. So your C-suites, um, any kind of, uh, I know Mark, you mentioned spear phishing, anyone who might be especially vulnerable to that. How, how can OSINT come into play there? Um, well, so I, I, we have, I have a very, very um, good personal answer to that question. Um, we have this problem. Uh, John 20 has this problem. Uh, when we get new employees on uh, almost every single time, because again, we are an organization that, that uh, we're, we're small, we're meant to be, we're meant to be small, we're meant to be agile, we're meant to be, we're meant to be out there in, in the world, but that means that we have to have a very public face, especially, especially as we go up the chain. And our, our owner and, and CEO, uh, America has a very, very, very large online presence, especially on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, we get almost every new employee that starts with us starts getting emails from Erica uh, asking them to do things, asking them to provide information, asking them to go and most famously buy a bunch of gift cards um, and uh, every single time. And it's it's I know it's funny and it, it, it's it, it we've we've it's kind of become a thing. We actually prepare people for this when they start. We actually do a um, we usually for for those that are going to have a big LinkedIn presence, especially our you know our consultants, the folks who are much more client facing. Uh, we do a LinkedIn sort of orientation, how to use LinkedIn, how to best you know put your best foot forward. But part of it is hey. Remember, the minute you basically put your information out there that you work for Beyond 20, you're going to start getting emails from Erica telling you to go buy gift cards uh, because it'll happen. Um, protecting sea level again, I think this goes back to what, what David was saying about knowing what, what information is already out there. Um, you know, they have it, right? It's already, if it's public, public, publicly available, the people who would do you harm, they've already got the information, right? They, they've got that data. The best defense, in my view, and, and I think, David, you'll agree, is you need to know what that data is, too, right? There's plenty of data that people don't know about me, right? I have a lot of information that's still private that isn't publicly available, but I should know what is publicly available. And by knowing that at any level, sea level on down, I can then understand, okay, well, everybody knows that, you know, I went to the United States Naval Academy, okay? Well, if somebody's going to try and use that against me, I better know that that information is out there. Right? Knowing that that info is available publicly is part of the defense. It's saying, okay, well, somebody comes to me and goes, hey, yeah, you know, I know your classmate from here and blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, everybody knows that. That doesn't mean you know me. That doesn't mean you have, that you are a legitimate person, right? That you're legitimately coming to me in any way. So I think that's probably the best the best and first line of defense is, is understanding what information is truly available about me out there um, and, and trying to limit more getting leaked out that I don't want leaked out. Um, so I think that I think that's probably that would be my, my first and, and foremost defense against uh, defense against the dark arts in that case. Oh, boy, two Harry Potter references in one webinar. That's terrible. I'm sorry. That's poor, <laughs> poor form. One per I'm webinar. So We've talked about I this. Know, I know, I know. We've had this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. We didn't have time to get to a couple uh, remaining questions, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. We are at the hour. So a huge thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope you found this helpful. I certainly learned a lot. And thank you, David. Thank you, Mark, for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. If you asked a question that didn't get answered we will hit you up with a private email um, answering that for you and you're going to get an email from me uh, either later today or tomorrow with a video of this session and some other helpful resources so have a great thursday everybody and we will see you next time <laughs>